Okay, thanks very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to uh, give a talk here. Also because, as you we will see, uh, several of uh, the ideas discussed uh, in my talk uh, came from discussion here at EHS uh, in my visit last year and also uh, last month. So, um, the focus of my talk is uh, about gravitational scattering and uh, it's quite easy to pose the problem, even if the problem at the end turns out to be uh, quite challenging. So the idea is that you take two elementary objects, where with the word elementary I mean that you can uh, um, characterize this object just uh, by few quantum numbers. So in my case I will be focusing on scalar objects in this talk. So they are basically characterized just by their momenta. And then you want to scatter them and they interact via gravitational interaction at a large impact parameter b here. So the problem is characterized by the impact parameter and the relative Lorentz factor, so the energy, the velocity of these two particles. And the question is, what is the final state? Can we characterize the final state of this, uh, of this problem? And the, qu the qualitative picture we have in mind is that if this impact parameter is large enough, so that the two objects avoid uh, coalesce, then you have as a final state uh, the two particles that are bended. And uh, if these two objects are different, then the bending angle will be in general different, right? So you will have one angle here and one angle there. And then you will never be able to avoid radiation. So in the final state, you expect some uh, gravitational radiation emitted uh, because of the acceleration of these two objects during the interaction. And the idea is to find explicit formulae, at least in some perturbative scheme that you will see better, for the observable, such as the angles, and the radiation, the spectrum, the total energy carried away by the radiation, uh, and, and such observables. In particular, an interesting, even though maybe not from the uh, experimental point of view, but from the conceptual point of view, an interesting regime is what happens if you take this relative Lorentz factor to be very large. Right? So you have this uh, high energy scattering at large uh, impact parameter. And uh, yeah, please feel free to stop me anytime uh, and we can try to make the talk as interactive as possible. So, uh, um, the, uh, what I will be presenting is based uh, on several papers, just taking a bit from various uh, work. Uh, the most recent ones uh, in collaboration with uh, Paolo Di Vecchia, Carlo Heisenberg uh, and Gabriele Veneziano. Um, and then I'll try to give a more general uh, overview of uh, uh, different works that have been done in particular in this high energy uh, in this high energy regime. So uh, from the technical point of view the approach I will be uh, using goes under the name as the gravitational iconal and uh, it takes advantage of uh, techniques that come not from uh, general relativity, but more from particle physics uh, um, world. So, um, Feynman diagrams, integration techniques, uh, um, unitarity cuts. Uh, over um, the last decades, I mean, several of these techniques have been perfectioned and uh, put at work in the context of particle physics, uh, QCD, uh, but it turns out that they are very well adapted also to analyze this problem. And uh, I think it's fair to say that they, con they, they started contributing in an interesting way uh, to this gravitational, uh, gravitational problem. And uh, the idea is that you start uh, as an input 
uh, if you want, uh, um, uh, as uh, uh, the quantities that characterize your scattering object, you start from the coupling that these objects have to gravity. So this is uh, an input, and in some sense, this characterizes what the objects are. Uh, then we will be using perturbative techniques, uh, as I mentioned, to extract not quantum observable, but classical general relativity observable. And that's a bit uh, the twist uh, of this uh, recent development. And this can be done in various approaches. It has been uh, a, a very active field of research. And the one I will be following uh, goes, as I said, under the name of Iconel. Uh, and the key idea is that uh, classical observables emerge through an exponentiation. So you will see that the, it's a rearrangement of perturbation theory. And uh, the bits of the perturbation theory that uh, 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 can be exponentiated, those correspond to the classical term we are interested in. One nice feature of this approach is that it's very general. It can uh, be applied to uh, all gravitational theories and to different types of scattering objects, even if today I will be focusing mainly on uh, GR and supergravity. And uh, for scattering objects, as I said, I will be focusing on scalar objects. But conceptually, and also in practice, uh, this can be done and has been done for different theories. Actually, my interest in the subject came more from uh, a theory point of view, kind of a Gedanken experiment in the context of string theory. So you can take this approach and then instead of using QFT amplitude, use string amplitude and uh, again select classical phenomena due to gravitational interaction between strings. You can use Kerr spinning objects and of course that's a very interesting and very, uh, uh, very active subject. You can use shock waves and uh, this will be relevant for, for us because when you take uh, this uh, high energy regime, you take the Lorentz factor to be large, then the scattering objects follow almost an null trajectory. And so you can think that uh, they approximate very well null shock wave. So uh, one object feels the gravitational force of the other as a shock wave uh, coming uh, against it. Um, so, yeah, this is just the general uh, philosophy and, uh, and now let me start more uh, concrete discussion. So here I'll try to depict a space-time picture and uh, uh, amplitude picture of a phenomenon which is a simplified version of the one that I had in the first slide. Because you, you see, oops, sorry, you see that I took away the radiation. So I'm starting from uh, an elastic uh, uh, case, which is not what happens in reality. But you will see that uh, one, can, uh, um, uh, one can take uh, a perturbative approach where radiation kicks at a later stage. And the calculation, the elastic calculation that we will be doing, they contain a warning that tells you when uh, 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 radiation is unavoidable. So at the first, uh, um, at the first uh, um, point, let me uh, analyze a simplified situation where there is no radiation. So there is just bending. And in the center of mass of the initial state, then in this case, the two angles are the same. Uh, so we will have one main physical observable, which is the deflection angle uh, that this uh, trajectory undergo. And uh, uh, the process uh, is uh, uh, characterized by a set of classical quantities. So one is the center of mass energy, which is related, directly related to this uh, relative Lorentz factor. Then there is an angular momentum, an orbital angular momentum that is related to the impact parameter. 
and then there is a total momentum transferred so that's the momentum that is responsible for uh, for this bending and just from kinematic relation you can relate this total momentum transfer to the uh, deflection angle that I depict here. So this is the uh, space-time uh, picture. So how do we calculate wh what type of uh, uh, ingredients we need to extract this uh, observable? Well, so as I said, uh, these gray boxes, these are the input. So they represent the coupling between the two objects, this one mass m1, this one mass m2, with gravitons and these black lines represent the gravitons that are exchanged between the two objects in the gravitational interaction. And the idea is to calculate all diagrams where an arbitrary number of gravitons is emitted by one object and an arbitrary number of gravitons is emitted by the other object. And all these gravitons are connected in this uh, uh, pink region uh, by just three amplitudes. Right? So that's the first uh, 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 ingredient that is telling that we are not calculating the full quantum problem, but we are already selecting the terms that are relevant uh, for uh, the classical analysis. Of course, the simplest possible three amplitude is just completely disconnected amplitude, just propagators connecting the top part and the bottom part. This would be ladder type diagrams. But uh, here you can have H-type diagrams, so here you have the non-linearities of general relativity that kicks in and you have to keep track, uh, track of them. So the goal seems to be clear, but impossible, right? Because what I'm saying is that you have to calculate uh, uh, a very complicated set of diagrams with a lot of gravitons ex exchange between these two heavy classical objects. Uh, and that's certainly out of the standard regime where we apply Feynman rules, where we start calculating the exchange of one uh, particle or two particles and things like that. So the first part, uh, in this first part, I want just to reconcile uh, uh, this uh, uh, tension, right, between what we want to do and what the standard techniques uh, seem to allow. And uh, I'll do that in a very pedestrian way, uh, which is, okay, let me start calculating what I know to calculate. Uh, so starting from this diagram here, let me do the simplest case where n is equal m is equal 1 and there is just one graviton uh, which is exchanged. And that's a, 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 um, quite a straightforward calculation. You can do by taking minimally coupled scalars to gravity, find the three uh, uh, vertex here, scalar, scalar, graviton and then just uh, uh, a glue with a dead under propagator, the upper part and the lower part. And uh, you'll find an answer which is quartic in the momenta because each of these vertex is quadratic in the momenta. And then start with a pole in this small q, which is the uh, momentum carried by this single graviton. And then, of course, there are also possibilities where the Lorentz algebra cancels this pole, and these are these dots. So here I'm doing a second ap uh, approximation. I'm, yeah, sorry, okay. I'm doing a second approximation. I'm not writing for you the full answer for this three-level diagram, but I'm writing only the bit which is non-analytic as q goes to zero. So there will be here terms where the Lorentz algebra cancels the 1 over q square related to the propagators. I'm not writing, uh, I'm not writing them. Well, the rationale for this is that what we would actually like to have is to take this answer and write it in terms of quantities that are classical quantities uh, related to this picture, this space-time picture on the left. So instead of writing the result in terms of the momentum carried by a single graviton, which is clearly a quantum, uh, a quantum uh, uh, object, 
we want to write it in terms of the relative distance between these two objects, the, uh, the, two, uh, the impact parameter. And you can do that just by taking a Fourier transform. So in general, Q is of order h bar, and B is a classical quantity. So Q is quantum and B is classical. And after Fourier transform, uh, you do this, this quantity, you obtain a result, which I will always indicate with this tilde. So this tilde refers to the impact parameter version of the amplitude result. So you, would ob uh, you obtain a, a, a quantity that you would like to interpret as a classical quantity. Now, it's easy to see here, right? If you do, for instance, in four dimension, you take the Fourier transform of one over Q square. Okay, there is a, uh, it's basically one, right? It starts with one over epsilon. Uh, and it's easy to see that you get something that goes like g times uh, the energy square, right? Here, sigma to the, the sigma square is energy to the fourth, but then it's divided by e times p, this is another energy square. So you get a quantity that goes like g times e square, where e is the energy of these heavy classical objects that are scattering. Now, this quantity here has the units of h bar. And so if you let me reinstate h bar, this is what you get. So you see explicitly the tension that I was mentioning conceptually before. If I calculate just the exchange of one graviton, hoping that this is a perturbative scheme, and then two graviton will be a smaller correction, three graviton exchange will be yet a smaller correction, well, then I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, going in the right direction because the one graviton exchange gives a very large quantity, right? G e square, classical number divided by h bar, right? So this is suggesting that what's actually happening is that uh, in this process many gravitons are exchanged. And uh, if you let me calculate the second, the next quantity uh, with two graviton exchange, the leading contribution will go like 1 over h bar square, will go like this quantity square. So the second correction is larger than, than the first one. And this is explicitly the breakdown of perturbation theory, which is due to the fact that now I'm assuming that these objects in blue and red are not elementary particle of few MeV, but they are black holes, if you like, solar masses particles. Lorenzo, sorry, yeah. just to be sure that I'm understanding the rules here from the quantum field theory point of view. So you are treating the blue and the red lines as uh, uh, external sources, which means that in the, in the vertices there is no energy momentum conservations. Uh, so for you, all this... No, no, actually they, they are dynamical. So you, there is energy momentum conservation here. So this is just the, uh, the crazy thing is that the, is the, uh, just minimally coupled scalar. So you can really write d mu phi, d nu phi, g mu nu square root g. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, but if they are dynamical, what the, the ladder diagrams becomes actually loops. Yes, yes, exactly. But if they are loops, they are not uh, uh, classical physics, as you were mentioning. So if, if to, to make them uh, classical, to my understanding, is uh, that you have to descend. I mean, there is a distinction between the quantum lines, which are the gravitons, and the external lines. If you treat all dynamical, then uh, these are uh, quantum correction. Uh, OK, you, you will see. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 what, what, I'm, uh, what I'm doing here uh, is uh, letting uh, uh, the calculation do the separation. So from the technical point of view, just treat everything dynamically. So here there will be propagators, right? 1 over p, p1 plus q1 square plus m1 square, right? This, the, the, there will be propagators. You treat this as a loop, right? You calculate everything uh, as a loop diagram. And then what you will be doing is uh, assume that this masses are large, right? And you want to rewrite the h-bar expansion by taking the mass to be classical. So uh, rewrite it in terms of g times m, call that Schwarzschild radius, that's a classical object. If you do that, 
and rewrite the one loop, I will have later a more explicit expression result, in terms of this classical quantity, you will see that it goes like uh, 1 over h bar square. After you uh, had taken some g and m and write it in terms of classical quantities. Right? So uh, what, what happens, and this can be, I mean, this is just a combinatoric exercise and can be done explicitly, is that the leading order behavior in this regime in 1 over h bar for the an arbitrary number of exchange, right, to two gravitons, three gravitons, four gravitons, is just the nth power of the leading order. With the coefficients coming from the combinatorics, uh, right, for saying that if you sum the leading order contribution, and then you take this Fourier transform, is the same as taking the exponential of the Fourier transform of the leading contribution. So this is, in practice, the exponentiation I was mentioning. Now, the exponentiation works exactly in the way you have in mind, right? So this leading order behavior actually comes from the fact that you can put this particle on shell, right? But I'm, I'm not forcing it at the beginning, right? I just do the calculation, and then you'll see that the leading order, the leading order terms comes from, uh, from this cut here. Uh, so in some sense, is uh, what, what you have in mind, but uh, done in a pedestrian way. So what I'm saying is that uh, this exponentiation is telling you that this quantity here, which is this A tilde that I brought here explicitly, is actually at the exponent, goes at the exponent, and that's the classical... Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. <coughs> so the calculation you have on that slide, it's exactly the same calculation you're doing in electrodynamics. So if I'm replacing masses by the charges, yeah. it's, it's exactly what you will be doing, looking for the classical scattering of two charge particles. Yeah, if you make the charge large, I think it's just, uh, it's just the same. Uh, uh, you know that the first graph is Coulomb law. It works perfectly well. There is no even notion of large or small quantity. It just works. In that sense, what's the meaning of this large quantity in that case, knowing that in, in electrodynamics there is no need to resolve these things in the classical theory? Well, I mean, there is no need. I, if you want to see it as, uh, uh, okay, I, I, if you, I, I think we agree, right? In the, this, this uh, calculation here, you can do it in electrodynamics exactly in the same way. You can think about uh, the trajectory of two classical charges and then a deflection angle. If you want to see that uh, as, a, as I will see as a stationary phase, uh, as a result of a stationary phase, then it's nice to resum this ladder diagram and show that this uh, object is at the exponent. Maybe in one slide you'll see the stationary phase and then the use I do of that. Okay, I understand that. But my point is that it's large quantity not because of the h-bar. It's not because of the denominator, because of numerators, because of large energies. Okay, uh, if you want uh, in here, right, this is uh, uh, large energy. Right, but uh, okay, this quantity at the numerator is uh, something that has the units of uh, angular momentum. So when it goes at uh, the exponent, it has to be a dimensionless number, right? So it goes, th this is the quantity that goes at the exponent. And second question, uh, not to, 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 okay. difference between electrodynamics and gravity, the electrodynamics, photons, exchange photons, they don't interact among themselves. Yeah. And then this exponentiation has very solid uh, status. Whereas you just expansion by brute force sort of class of diagrams, which are not gauge invariant to start with. You will see that the nonlinearities will, uh, will, uh, will appear later, right? And that's where gravity becomes more complicated than, uh, than, uh, than QD. But this quantity that is, goes at the exponent, which, uh, okay, this, this is the iconal phase, that quantity is a gauge invariant quantity. Right, so th this uh, uh, th at the end is related to an observable, uh, which is this angle, right? So, so that, that, that is a uh, gauge invariant quantity. You can compare with a uh, classical result of uh, trajectories calculated in any coordinates you, you want. Yeah, but I agree with you. I mean, uh, here, this leading iconal comes from a subset of diagrams. And of course, the interesting question uh, uh, is what about all the rest? Can you organize them in a way that there is a controlled 
uh, expansion so that you can improve on this iconal in, 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 a, in, in, in a consistent way. Yeah, so maybe let me come uh, to that after making a, a comment still on the leading iconal. Uh, okay, sorry, so this is the uh, uh, stationary phase argument that I just mentioned, so let me be very brief, right? So uh, the exponentiation here works uh, in a uh, nice way in uh, impact parameter space, just because on this side, before doing the, the Fourier transform, it's a convolution. You do the Fourier transform, becomes a product, so that's why it works nicely in impact parameter space. But if you want to find the S matrix, in, in standard momentum space, you can Fourier transform back after exponentiating, right? So this is the, the result of the exponentiation and then you Fourier transform back. And now you find this big Q. So what is the difference between small Q and big Q? Well, big Q is the momentum transferred of the real process, the process that involves many gravitons exchanged because you are doing the Fourier transform after exponentiation and the exponentiation knows about infinite uh, gravitons exchanged. So this big Q is, is, is not a quantum object, it's large. So you have this big, uh, this massive object that deflect. So big Q is, is a classical large quantity. And uh, as we mentioned, it's directly related to the angle. So how can you do this Fourier transform? Well, if uh, this uh, iconal is large, then you can do a saddle point, a stationary phase, and you find the relation between big Q, which is related to the angle, and the iconal phase. So what you can do, you can take this answer, take the derivative with respect to B, and then you find an explicit expression for the angle. Right. Now, I call this 1 p.m. angle because of, uh, uh, of what we just discussed. There will be correction to this. And the point I want to stress is that this result, this 1 p.m. angle... Which p.m. means post-Minkowskian for people? Okay, yes, with p.m. means post-Minkowskian, yeah, thanks. Uh, this, uh, uh, this quantity, uh, which is ju just derived from here, Right? You divide Q divided by P here. And you uh, it has uh, a nice uh, ultra-relativistic limit. And I want to explain what I mean by this ultra-relativistic limit. So I take sigma large. So the two objects are very fast. The energy is very large. But you keep fix this combination. So E is the total energy in the center of mass. So G times E is like uh, a Schwarzschild radius. So that's uh, the radius of the black hole that, you, that, that the black hole, a black hole of mass equal to the total center of mass energy would have, right? So take E large, but keep fixed this quantity. And then if you do this limit, then you can forget this one. Sigma is very large. And you'll see that the powers of E combine in a nice way so that the angle in this large energy uh, regime, in this ultra-relativistic regime, takes this quantity, uh, which is finite, right? You see, it's Re is the quantity we keep finite, so Nb is the impact parameter. So this result was found a long time ago, I think in the 80s, by Toft, by studying just the uh, uh, interaction between two eichelberg sexel shock waves. So this is this uh, uh, continuity that I was mentioning. You can start with massive object and then crack up, crank up the Lorentz factor and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and then you smoothly go over the, uh, a different result of a different problem where shock waves uh, interact. So one question uh, that uh, we investigated, but you will see we have only partial answer, is that is this a general feature? not just for this leading order approximation, but for the actual phenomenon. Is it always true that I can smoothly connect with the uh, uh, scattering between uh, shock waves? Okay, so this is coming back uh, uh, to your question, but there is more uh, life than just ladder and cross ladder diagrams. So here is, uh, is a depiction of a vertex uh, a contact vertex, but then in the dots, dots uh, 
there will be uh, also a, a kind of triangle shaped diagram with a three graviton vertex in the middle. Yeah, please. Are those Feynman diagrams or just schematic? Yeah, I mean, for me, these are really Feynman diagrams, but uh, uh, you see there are a lot of dots here. So there will be diagrams where you have a three graviton vertex in the middle and uh, you have to sum all of them. Now, uh, as Stefano has rightly in mind, of course, from the point of view of the integration, the separation in diagrams doesn't make gauge invariant sense. So you have really to sum up everything and then isolate things in different classes of integrals. And then you will have box-like integrals, you will have triangle-type integral and so on and so forth. So I'm hiding all this uh, uh, complication. And uh, I'm just uh, saying that, okay, think you have done that. Uh, and then you have a momentum space answer for the uh, uh, diagram with two graviton exchanged. And then let me write it in uh, expansion, isolating the non-analytic term as uh, Q1 plus Q2, which I call Q, goes to zero. So same. Uh, uh, same idea as before, we want to look at these non-analytic terms because are those that are relevant for the large distance interaction. And this is the one that is leading, Q square, this is 1 over Q, Q to the epsilon, so on and so forth. So this Q square here is the one that we already accounted for in this exponentiation. So that object, if you write it explicitly, you will see that it's exactly goes like 1 over h bar square and it's uh, 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 the uh, result of the uh, uh, expansion of this e to the 2i delta at the second order. So this object does not contain new information. If you want, it's just a cross check that the exponentiation that I mentioned before actually happens. And the object in red, which crucially takes information from these other diagrams that were not included before, contains new information. And uh, it was calculated a long time ago by, in the 80s by Westphal, and uh, we redid the calculation in general D, and it takes this form. And then you can run through this saddle point argument as before, and find a correction to the deflection angle that you see this 2 p.m. as Thibault was saying means that it is weighted with the Newton constant square. So this object here was Newton constant to the 1 and this is Newton constant square. So if you work uh, in a regime where the size of your object is small with respect to the impact parameter, this watch I radius is small with the impact parameter, this correction will be subleading with respect to this correction here. And then you can ask the same question. What happens if I crank up the Lorentz factor and I go to high energy? And then in this case, you'll see that this actually goes to zero. It's suppressed by a ratio of the masses and the energy. And uh, uh, this seems to be... Uh, so. Uh, one would like to argue that this is a general pattern. Uh, the contribution to the uh, um, shockwave case, to the high uh, ultra relativistic case, comes from uh, uh, the exchange of an odd number, one, three, five. But this guy does not contribute to high energy. Very good. So maybe it's a good time to stop before going. So, so this is the easy part. Uh, and uh, 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 basically at this stage, uh, um, uh, I think I got interested in this problem, moving away from string theory, more going more to uh, black hole scattering, thanks to a talk Thibault gave at GGI, I think in uh, 2018. Well, he was saying, okay, uh, this is the easy part. The, the really interesting one where uh, there are novelties is the one where three gravitons are exchanged at 3 p.m. So that's where I'm turning now, unless there are questions. Yeah, sorry, Rolof, I have a question. Yeah. So since you are treating everything quantum, I, I didn't get precisely where the iconal uh, approximation in a sharp way enters in your computation. It seems 
yeah. to me that you're yeah. doing, uh, right? for instance, that the Q is more or the, the large impact parameter, where do they actually enter? Yeah, so, so in the, but basically, yes, yes, let me try, let me see whether I can, I can clarify this point. So basically in two points, first uh, I'm doing this, uh, 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 I'm isolating this non-analytic part, so I'm throwing away terms that would be relevant for a full quantum problem, that are uh, uh, um, localized, that are relevant only when the scattering is localized, when the two objects are, uh, are close to each other. So this is a key simplification also in doing the Feynman integrals, because at the end, uh, these Feynman integrals will depend only on one variable. You see Q is expanded, and you see this function here, a function just of sigma. So uh, it will be a one variable problem uh, from the kinematics point of view. So this is one place where this classical uh, simplification enters. And the other uh, place is uh, uh, basically you, you, rev you, this S is the S matrix. So is one plus uh, uh, the amplitude. And uh, we want to rewrite it. So this is the rearrangement I was mentioning. We want to rewrite it in this form. So all the bits that have 1 over h bar should go at the exponent. And the exponent should have only a factor of 1 over h bar. I don't allow 1 over h bar square, right? That, that would be counterintuitive from the classical limit, right? It's the kind of WKB uh, formulation. So the, the magic is that on this left-hand side, when you do this calculation, you will find 1 over h bar square, 1 over h by cube, right? They should all rearrange uh, so that the divergent part in h bar goes here at the exponent. And then this prefactor in front, that's a quantum prefactor, uh, and, uh, uh, and that does not enter in the determination of this, uh, of this classical, uh, classical quantities. So this is in our formalism. There, there are other ways. Uh, I mean, uh, the EFT uh, of Stefan and collaborator, uh, Kozower and collaborator. There are other ways of rearranging this uh, full-fledged uh, uh, amplitude calculation to extract the classical uh, result, and, and this is one, one way. Yeah, please. So gravitational radiation doesn't appear at average G squared? The committee, sorry. The gravitational radiation effects? No, no, exactly. Surprise, at the next order. I mean, to be fully precise, th th there is, but let me not enter into this, uh, there is a, an angular momentum part that uh, one can already see at the G square, which has a bit of a different status, but radiation carried away by on shell gravitons starts at order G cube. Please. Is there a, any classical observable where big delta can enter? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think so. So big delta for us is important just to rewrite S. But at the end, we never, I, I mean, for it, it I mean, in, in, you need both big delta and small delta to define the two things, right? Because of, uh, right, uh, but once, once you write it in this form, the classical observables are all derived from the things that is at the exponent. In some sense, it's what you expect. Do you really mean delta h bar 0 or h bar to the 1? No, h bar 0. It can start with h bar 0. Principle. Yeah. This one is 1 over h bar. OK. OK, this is the mess. So that was the challenge that, uh, that Thibault uh, put forward for the amplitude community. So calculate the contribution of the exchange of three gravitons. The conception of the part, and as I, sa as I said before, there is uh, the most non-analytic one, a subleading one, a sub-subleading one. These two objects do not contain new information. We just calculate them in our approach just as a cross-check that the exponentiation that I mentioned works. All the new quantities that are relevant for classical contribution at order G Newton cube are hidden in this term. 
and uh, uh, and then if you uh, uh, do the f integrals and everything to find this phase and this delta 2 means uh, it's uh, two, 3 p.m. Uh, so it's g cube uh, okay that, that's that, that's what you uh, what you find and this has been found uh, in, in steps the easiest piece of all is this one in pink uh, and that's the prob limit so this is determined by just uh, the motion or uh, you, you can think of uh, treating one object as a static Schwarzschild of mass m1 and the other object, classical object, just uh, following geodesic motions and then you can ask what is the angle that this probe does and what is the iconal related to that angle and, and that's this pink part so this is entirely fixed by the probe limit and uh, uh, it's just geodesic motion uh, the bit in black here uh, well, in some sense, the first uh, result uh, uh, that was not known, uh, coming from amplitude that was not known by other uh, approaches. And uh, it was uh, put forward in this paper. So it's a very important proof of concept that this is uh, a, a useful approach that can provide new, uh, new result. And this black and pink is the uh, knowledge in uh, 2019. Now, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask uh, the same question, what happens if I do this high energy limit? And uh, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, black part, so the, the uh, pink, purple part does not contribute the, in this high energy limit, but this black part has a, a singular behavior, essentially due to this uh, function here. Uh, for large sigma, this is just like log sigma. So uh, it looks like uh, it's uh, logarithmically divergent and, uh, uh, and so that this calculation has nothing to do with the uh, deflection that shock waves would uh, uh, undergo at order, uh, at order g cube. This was a puzzling feature, sorry I, I should have put here uh, as a reference but this later, because back in 1990 Amati Ciafaloni and Veneziano uh, gave a finite uh, uh, prediction for uh, that deflection for massless objects, uh, so for, in some sense, for shock waves. So the question was how to reconcile uh, this result of Bern and collaborator and this old result by Amati and collaborator. And uh, uh, as you see, this is a mess, and uh, uh, a lot of mess is the second part, these final five lines, uh, to which I come later. So let me just uh, first focus on this uh, uh, first uh, high energy crisis here. Maybe yeah. <coughs> so there is a free division sequence in the third line. Yes, 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 yes. W why didn't it appear? Uh, yes, the yes, I'll, I'll come to, to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tried to, try to hide that, but you spotted it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course. But yeah, let me come to that. So, uh, so first, uh, let me focus on these two lines, that is the real part of delta. And come and to this energy crisis, which is uh, uh, hidden in this uh, 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 in this uh, bit, and uh, uh, oh my god, I'm super slow. Uh, so um, so this is the log divergent bit. So this is uh, this black part goes under the name potential graviton. So let me not enter uh, too much into that. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the challenging thing was that uh, if you take this black part and you expand for small velocity, so Lorentz factor goes to 1, the result matched all known PN data in a very non-trivial way. And, uh, and people also produced new uh, results from a post-Newtonian approach and uh, they kept finding perfect matching. So it, w it looked very hard to modify this answer in a way that you keep the good part, so matching with the post-Newtonian analysis, but cure this log divergent part. Now, uh, since the problem here is very complicated, uh, uh, we started studying uh, the uh, n equal 8 supergravity version of that, which has a much simpler answer, fewer diagrams, 
And in that case, and this is this paper in 2008, we understood that there was a new type of contributions that are not related to potential gravitons, but they are related to gravitons that are going on shell. And they modify and they produce this bit in blue here. Uh, so this is the GR version, but there is an n equal 8 version, identical version that is uh, uh, here. And uh, uh, after we, we pointed this out in n equal 8, t boy immediately did the GR calculation. And here I'm quoting uh, the answer that he had in, in that paper for these terms in blue. Now, if you take these terms in blue and you, and you do the small velocity answer, uh, expansion, you'll see that they have a different parity for the term in black. So these have all odd velocity and this is all even velocity. And this explains this mystery, why these new terms do not spoil the matching that people had uh, with PN data, because they were looking at the even part, and uh, the even part does not get contribution from uh, this new type of uh, uh, con uh, this new type of uh, con yeah, uh, contribution that goes under the name of radiation reaction. You'll see better why. But of course, if you take these results and you go to large sigma, uh, then there is no difference between p and even and p and odd. And you can see by i that this large sigma here, you have 2 square times 2 is 8, uh, divided by 2 is 4, sigma uh, uh, 4, 6, 5, so it's sigma square overall. And it cancels exactly minus 4, sigma square. So in this parenthesis, uh, uh, that's what I'm saying here, in the UR, UR limit, in the altruistic uh, limit, the log divergent term, they cancel out. And so this is solving this energy crisis. But even more, so if you now look at the non-log divergent terms uh, and you do the same algebra, I try to stick to the color. So purple is the probe, blue is the radiation reaction, and black is the potential graviton. So this is the uh, leading energy behavior here. And they sum up, you see with the mm, not expiring number, exactly to the answer by Amati, Ciafaloni and Veneziano. So this uh, clarified that that answer contained a radiation reaction term. Uh, and uh, also, and there were a series of papers uh, uh, checking this fact, that this answer is universal. So we calculated in GR, we calculated in n equal 8, and then uh, people calculated in n equal 4, in n equal 2, just uh, as a set of possible theories with different matter content. And this is uh, always the result you find. And this goes well with the idea that at high energy, this is the title of Toft paper, uh, there is a graviton dominance, right? So the only thing that matters is the graviton, is the object that couples to the energy. The dilatons, for instance, couple to the mass. Uh, and so all the decoration of supergravity become irrelevant at the high energy, and, uh, uh, and the graviton is uh, what basically fixes the answer. Okay, so this was the status uh, uh, end of 2000. Uh, and now let me come to the question, but what about the imaginary part, right? I was just focusing on these first two lines, and then there are five lines with an imaginary part. And worse, this imaginary part is infrared divergent. So this is the signal that uh, the process, the elastic approximation is breaking down, right? So if you think about taking this delta and, and writing the S matrix as e to the 2i delta, then that there is, an exp that there is a, 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 no, a part which is not a phase, right? Because i multiplied by this i, all this will be a real contribution. And, uh, and uh, uh, that real contribution is suppressing the elastic uh, process. It's telling you, actually, no, uh, this process that you want to study does not exist. Uh, and uh, it's very rare. And because of this divergence, basically, it never exists. So this is related to the emission of gravitons that you were asking. And uh, you see that uh, the formalism is telling you that a G cube is unavoidable. 
you have to take uh, non-elastic uh, process into account if you want to give a, a, a unitary description of your process, right? There is a new channel opening up that will explain this imaginary part. Uh, I, and this will be the final, I don't know if I can take uh, uh, 20. I mean, yeah, that's the basically the second part of my talk. And that's mm, where um, a lot of research is now going on to understand these non-elastic processes. So you use dimensional regularity. Yes, yes. So uh, which typically is not easy in this uh, renormalization scheme to disentangle UV and IR. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Yes, yes. I'm sure that this is an IR. Uh, yes, yes. But let me maybe okay, okay. offline we can. But yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, this is an IR term. And, uh, and OK, maybe later I can point out it's important that this epsilon is negative. Uh, and you will see that that's, that's what the, uh, ensures that there is a suppression. Very good, yes. Okay, this energy, uh, and so now, okay, we have to include radiation. Right? Uh, so in, ampli in an amplitude languages, language, what is radiation, right? What is the new key ingredient, right? Before we were discussing graviton exchange and diagrams uh, with a lot of exchange gravitons, but initial and final state, just two massive particles and two massive particles. So what is the new ingredient? Well, the new ingredient is uh, uh, a new building block, an amplitude, with, uh, 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 in the final state, an extra massless particle. And you can literally think that this extra massless particle is one of the quanta in the radiation, right? And radiation will be uh, the result, the classical radiation, will be a result of a second exponentiation. So you'll see that the, the uh, kind of uh, uh, fil rouge of this iconal approach is exponentiation. Not just exponentiation of the graviton exchange, but also exponentiation of the graviton emitted. Right? Uh, and uh, so the uh, idea is that you, instead of talking about an iconal phase, you will have to talk about an iconal operator. And that operator acts on the Fox space of the emitted quanta. So for instance, in GR is the emitted graviton. So this A and A dagger are the creation and relation operator of on-shell gravitons. And the classical radiation will be a coherent type state, so will be an exponential of A plus A dagger. Uh, that takes into account the exponentiation of this building block. What is the coefficient of this, uh, of this uh, um, coherent state? Well, it's derived from this amplitude. So what you have to do is calculate the five-point amplitude. Again, there are a lot of diagrams. You can uh, put your graviton on the external state. You can put your graviton emitted by other gravitons. So you have even at three level is not not that trivial, right? And uh, uh, that object will go, uh, will define this quantity here in a way that has been discussed uh, in this paper. I will not give you the details, but I'm happy to discuss after the talk. Yeah, yeah just to understand, this exponentiation is uh, uh, some result of the calculation or just guess? Okay, you will see. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. In some sense, uh, in some regime, and the first one I will discuss, the, the one that I will discuss more in detail is uh, related to the phase you were wa wondering about. And that's just the uh, uh, block norsic and Weinberg exponentiation. So there it's, it's, it's proof. Uh, it's proven. That, re okay, l l let, me, let me maybe, yeah. Uh, for the full uh, for the full, it will be uh, an hypothesis that you have to check. But yeah, maybe let me, uh, yeah, okay, these are. Uh, so the, the easy bit, here you see that I have to account for graviton emitted of all possible uh, momenta. Uh, of course, they will never be very hard. So the, 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 the classical radiation will be made, uh, uh, made out, but a, a, a large number of soft gravitons. 
But there is a soft scale, which is v over b. b is the impact parameter, b is the velocity of my object. And we are working in a regime where b, b is very large. So even in the ultra relativistic regime where v is 1, this is a small number. Now, I want, there are two different regions. If the frequency of the graviton emitted is smaller than 1 over b, or larger than 1 over b. And this 1 over b is a small quantity. Now, the regime where omega, the frequency, the energy of the graviton, is more than 1 over b, uh, I call that soft radiation. That regime can be studied by using Weinberg approach or block Norsic. You mean much smaller? Much smaller, yeah. There was, yes. So let me introduce a, a, a cutoff, omega star, just to separate this soft region from the non soft region. Of course, I should keep, keep everything in, but in order to address the problem, uh, that you were saying, let me start from the easy bit. In that case, I can write explicitly this bit in a simple way, because this graviton is attached only to the external legs, and uh, I can factorize this, this graviton out in this, uh, in this line here. Right? Um, so, in this soft regime, this first line, the one that contains uh, the coherent state that contains the creation and relation operator of the graviton, acts on the second line that describes just the hard scattering of the process. So the second part here is the elastic one, and this is the, uh, is the dressing. And then you can ask, what is the probability amplitude for the elastic process? Right? The probability amplitude is you start with an initial state which has no radiation, just two particles. You apply the S matrix. This is the uh, classical limit of the S matrix. It's just this iconal operator. And then you put the same initial state. Right? So that's the probability amplitude for the elastic result. Now, in order to do this calculation, I have to use uh, the BCH formula to separate this coherent state. And so I get a contribution which is quadratic in this f, right? Is f f star coming just from the normal ordering of the, is just the norm of the coherent state, if you wish. And if you do the calculation, is this, where this big f is just the, the integral uh, coming from uh, f star f. And all these integrals uh, were done in the original paper uh, by Van Berg. And uh, so you can write an explicit expression. Uh, and uh, the question is, is this explicit expression the origin of this imaginary part? That's what you would expect, right? So that this uh, divergent imaginary part is related to the emission of a lot of soft gravitons. So if you promote your iconal phase to an iconal operator, you don't need this term. This term will be automatically produced once you force the, C, the problem to be the elastic problem. If you calculate a more inclusive problem, you will not find the divergence. Right? So it's a very concrete question whether this line is coming out from this, and you can check that it works. So the imaginary part is exactly related uh, to, uh, uh, to, to this, to this only term. The soft only the soft. soft part. Only the soft parts are relevant for the uh, infradivergent bit. Now, of course, the general idea is that if now you promote the operator to the full operator, now that would be responsible for the entire imaginary part, right? But for the soft part is, uh, is the first one we discussed in this paper here, is, is the easiest one. Very good. So let me do something 
uh, with this result and connect this result with an old uh, result in GR. So that's kind of typical of these things, right? We discover a uh, new result from amplitude and we say, ah, okay, that's what they did in year 77. Uh, so uh, SMART calculated uh, the soft limit of the energy spectrum. So this is the energy carried out, out carried away by soft gravitons uh, as function of omega. And then you take omega to be very small. So that's the soft limit. That's nice. That's what we were doing. And, uh, uh, and um, can we reproduce this result? Now, this uses a general idea of these iconal operators. So now the operator gives access to new observables that were not uh, uh, there, were not available, were not uh, uh, calculable if you just worked with the iconal phase. And the idea is what you do in class in standard quantum mechanics, right? So you have a, 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 an operator that produces a final state. Psi is your initial state. E to the 2i delta hat is your final state. And classical quantities are just expectation values of your observable in this final state. So for instance, you can take the energy, right? A dagger A, so this is the energy of each graviton. You sum over all possible gravitons. That's the observable related to the energy carried away by the gravitons. And you sandwich this in the final state. That should be the energy carried out by the radiation, by the gravitons. And then you can do it with the angular momentum, which is a bit more subtle. You can do with any classical observable. You can write an operator expression, stick it here, and calculate the expectation value. Now, if you do it for this with, uh, uh, with this uh, iconal operator, you'll see, uh, you'll get this relation. You basically see that uh, uh, this uh, energy spectrum is the same quantity that you call the imaginary part of the iconal. It's the same integrand, exactly the same, except that it, it, for a numerical factor. So basically, you can read the, uh, the soft limit of the energy spectrum, starting from this line and multiplying by minus 4 epsilon. And indeed, the square parenthesis is exactly its mal result. For, uh, for the soft limit. OK, so that's very nice. But you see here, in this answer, we find again this log divergence, right? Cosh inverse arc cosh sigma for large sigma is log sigma. This was problematic before in another observable, the, the deflection angle. And so one may wonder whether it's problematic also in this case. Can I take a large sigma uh, limit of this result by SMAR and see what happens. And this is energy crisis too. And indeed you have a problem. And you can phrase the problem in the following way. Calculate just the energy carried away by soft gravitons. That certainly is smaller than the total energy. The energy is always additive. So if I calculate the energy carried away by soft gravitons, that will be just a fraction. Still, the fraction of the energy carried away by soft gravitons that you can calculate starting from here is logarithmically divergent because of this cosh. And so one says, OK, that, that's a problem, right? Logarithmic divergence means that you, you see, uh, if I create, if I construct the ratio, energy emitted, the divided initial energy, a certain point becomes bigger than one, which, which certainly cannot, cannot be. Now, in this problem, there is a, a clear way out. And the reason is thanks to Weinberg. It's thanks to the fact that we know this answer exactly. So we exponentiated both the exchange graviton and the emitted gravitons. So instead of uh, uh, writing this calculation in a small expansion, uh, this is the PM expansion, 
right? This uh, Q, remember, is uh, proportional to the deflection angle, to theta. So this Q contains inside the G. So this parameter, you would think, is small because the numerator contains G. Uh, and the answer I'm quoting here, you see that's why there are these dots, is just the leading term uh, uh, of what you get from, uh, from, from this calculation in this small Q over M expansion. Right, so let me undo that step. And since we have the full result, let me just write for you the full result. So this is the full result. And if you take Q over M small, you go back to this result here. That's what Smart had in 77. And uh, OK, this in principle was already included in Weinberg, but I don't think it was written out explicitly uh, before our paper. Now, you see that this uh, quantity has an interesting analytic structure. Uh, you may wonder that it has a singularity for Q equals 0, because Q equals 0, you see, you have 1 minus 1 in the denominator. But the singularity in the denominator cancels with the singularity of the numerator, and the actually the point Q equals 0 is smooth. You can analytically continue through Q equals 0. Here, this function here. And you can go up to Q squared over 2M squared equal minus 2. If this is minus 2, 1 minus 2 is minus 1. And this again is 0 denominator. At that point, you have a singularity. And it's a branch cut. It's a branch cut that starts from an unphysical point uh, in the scattering process, right? Because Q square is negative. In a scattering process, Q square is positive. But from the point of view of seeing this as an analytic function, it's a singularity. And this singularity fixes the radius of convergence of the Q over M expansion. Right? If you have a singularity, then, OK, the whole circle uh, it becomes the, uh, I mean, the maximum uh, amount right, that you can reach by doing an expansion. So this is telling you that the Q over M expansion has a fixer, as a radius of convergence, which is finite, not infinite. And so if you want to go to a regime where Q is much bigger than M square, then you cannot expand. You have to work with this result. OK, so this is the amplitude perspective. And then, as I told you, well, you discovered that this was known. So uh, this mentioned in kind of a long detailed paper, which for me is very hard to read, that there is a threshold. And uh, uh, if you translate this threshold uh, uh, in particle physics uh, quantity, is exactly this threshold of, of Q, sub m, or Q over m. And uh, in more GR quantities, it's a threshold between root sigma and theta. Now, we are saying PM expansion theta is small. But 1 over root sigma can also be very small. If you go to very high energy, ultra relativistic regime, 1 over root sigma becomes very small. And so you have two regimes, two classical regimes. They are both classical, but they are two different regimes. Theta is smaller than 1 over root sigma. And that's the standard PM expansion, the one where the formula by SMAR works. And then there is a regime where theta uh, is larger than 1 over root sigma, but still small. And that's a new regime. That's the a new ultra relativistic regime. And this is for radiation. And so if you take this answer here and you do that expansion above this threshold, uh, then this is the answer you find. And you see that it's n there is no divergence. This log sigma divergence has been cured. And the price you pay is that you get answers that are non-analytic in, in the Newton constant. right? Because theta, this angle, remember, is pro proportional to g. So this non-analyticity comes exactly because of you did this resummation. You, you resummed the infinite number of diagrams, uh, and uh, the analytic properties uh, can change. 
And uh, this was uh, uh, already noticed in, this, uh, in these papers uh, around uh, uh, 10 years ago. No, I think, uh, I think this is uh, uh, as long as uh, uh, you let me ignore nonlinear memory effect. Uh, I think this is completely uh, uh, on solid grounds because it's just uh, a consequence of Weinberg uh, theorem uh, for soft uh, uh, emissions. I thought at some point you had doubts about the log. Uh Th that will be a third energy crisis. You'll see. Yeah, the problem. Th this one, this one is fine. Uh, the, the log you have in mind will come, I think, one in a couple of slides. Because it's still soft here. Yeah. This is still soft, exactly. The log uh, uh, you, you are thinking is for the whole radiation. But uh, on the right, uh, yeah, it's still, but here there is no soft cutoff on the right, so. The, this is just the energy carried away from, uh, okay, so, enough, be, very good. They gave the total energy. Yes, the total energy, I'm coming to that. Maybe you were asking, what about this uh, soft cutoff that I introduced? Uh, I, I just... Yes, uh, because I just took it, uh, just, just to give an estimate, I just took it to be equal 1 over b. That's the maximal value. So I, th this is, you see, this is uh, an estimate and uh, uh, I'm... Up to 1 over b. Up, up to 1 over b, yeah, exactly. Uh, if you do half of that, there will be a numerical factor here that changes. But the analytic property theta cube log theta, uh, th that's, uh, that's solid. And, and it's just Weinberg. I think it's just was not uh, written explicitly, but uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so OK, this is, uh, uh, let me be brief, because I think I'm taking too long. Uh, uh, le, le, so, so what Thibault already had in mind is, OK, OK, this is uh, all for the energy carried away by soft gravitons. What about the real observable? The total energy carried away, I mean, by all gravitons, right? Uh, how much energy uh, the particles lose in this scattering? This was an, another very nice result by Hermann Parma Martinez, Rufen Zeng, that I think was new. Uh, which was to give a full PM, uh, so function of this Lorentz uh, factor sigma, uh, answer for the energy radiated by uh, away by the gravitons. And as we understood, it starts with G cube. And you see, in GR is this complicated mess. And then you can ex expand for small velocities, and there is uh, many checks, uh, and uh, Donato here and uh, Thibault uh, had uh, a lot of uh, uh, essential data for people to be sure that uh, we are on the right track. Uh, that, that match between this uh, full Lorentz invariant answer and the small velocity answer here. I'm not showing, but there are analog formulae for other observable, like uh, the angular momentum loss, right? So that there is an initial orbital angular momentum, gravitons are carried away, and they take away not just energy, but also angular momentum. And you can, we can calculate those. Uh, and there is a very nice paper by Mano, Rigway, and Shen, and we reproduce that answer uh, and generalize uh, from the iconal perspective. Um, so you can run the same question. You have these observables. The claim is that they are valid for all values of sigma. What is the high energy behavior? Right? Um, and so far, we have seen two patterns. We have seen uh, the deflection angle where the high energy behavior was smooth, right? It just uh, didn't, the, all the divergence canceled. And then things that are related to the uh, emitted energy where there was a threshold. And that threshold meant that when you go for sigma too large, the qualitative 
feature of the answer change. So here you would expect maybe more of the second because it's the total energy radiated. And actually this is the case. Uh, and, uh, and this is the energy crisis number three. Um, so let me just mention two features. Uh, you also have this log sigma here, but it now comes uh, twice. There is a log sigma and another log sigma for large sigmas. And uh, this bit in red shows that at large sigma, the logarithmic singularity cancel out. That was a bit of a mystery. Why, I mean, certainly it's not by chance. And then, uh, looking back at paper by Diet, and then as Gabriel explained his work with Colfrey and Ciaffaloni, this is due to an interesting physical effect, which is the following. When the uh, Lorentz factor increases, the radiation emitted gets focused, gets beamed, and uh, the radiation wants not to go uh, randomly, but follow the uh, particles that are emitting. So this uh, uh, theta uh, graviton is the angle between the emitted graviton and the massive black hole, the particles. And you'll see that uh, as, uh, um, uh, as you go away from the soft limit, uh, this theta graviton gets focused and uh, gets focused a lot when uh, uh, you reach um, values that uh, where omega b are, are of the order root sigma. So when root sigma is very large, this is, this is very focused. So you don't mean here, because there is the synchrotron beaming only, but you mean in addition to the beaming to high energy, like synchrotron, there is a gravitational extra focusing, you mean? Yeah. An extra thing in the Venetiano closing. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I was uh, a bit quick here. So, uh, this beaming kicks in when you leave the soft region. So, it's related to this parameter omega b. Right? So, uh, soft region means uh, uh, omega much smaller uh, than b. Uh, when omega b starts being order 1 or larger, right, this 1 divided by omega b becomes smaller. And so the gravitons that are not so soft, they are beamed. And uh, uh, the maximum value of this theta graviton is 1 over root sigma. So when 1 over root sigma, when root sigma is large, then the maximum value becomes small. This intermediate region here um, is, uh, is the one, I think, that is discussed in, uh, uh, in, uh, in these papers uh, here. Now, the log that you had in mind, which is the... Uh, so, so basically, the idea is that if you want to calculate the total energy radiated, you have to sum the soft radiation and the contribution of these gravitons those that have frequency larger than 1 over b. Um, now, if you say that that's all that, that you have, then you would have a total energy radiated of this structure here. Now, this is not, as you said, what Gruzinov and Veneziano proposed, because uh, uh, in their approach, they are seeing that there is a long tail of gravitons that are much more energetic than uh, uh, 1 over root sigma, or in the high energy regime, 1 over uh, r, um, and that the real cutoff, the final cutoff they find is, is this one. So this is, uh, may maybe we can, okay, we can discuss this separately if you're interested. This is the uh, proposal of Gruzinov Veneziano. And what I want just to stress is that it comes from a long tail of high energy, uh, of high energy gravitons. So energy crisis number three is all about this cutoff. 
So what is the maximum frequency of the gravitons emitted in a scattering at very high energy? And uh, uh, so far the best uh, proposal that we have is this one, but there is no uh, clean, I would say, uh, independent answer. And so this is still an open problem at the first order in where radiation kicks in. In your middle formula, there is still the E. There is an infinite for E goes to infinity here. Yeah. You are still saying that the yes. fraction of radiated energy to total yes. energy yes. diverges. So, so, so it's a big crisis. Uh, here yes. is just a long issue. No? Yes, yes, sorry. OK, very good. Yeah, let me clarify this point because I was, uh, I, I was a bit uh, confused. So uh, this answer here comes directly from this one. So here we have, as the boy is saying, a, a real mathematical inconsistency, inc or physical inconsistency, if you want, because you have a power, like power law divergence in the fraction of energy emitted. Now, here I'm saying better than what I... My, uh, so suppose that this answer is true only below this bound by d, which is a reasonable thing to do because even the soft radiation was of that type. Right? So one can say, let me suppose that this is the case and assume that when I go above the bound by d, all these divergences that are root sigma, which are e, are transmuted in 1 over theta. This is the bound, right? Root sigma is e. So theta is order 1 over e. Right? So that's what happened in the soft regime. And the idea is that let us assume that the same happens for the whole radiation. Then this 1 over e would be becoming just a 1 over theta. And that's responsible for the announcement from cube to square. So there is an announcement, but it's not infinite. And now the question, the second question is the fine detail. If that's the case, is this all what it is? So just this transition as it happened for the soft region, or there is a new region that was not there in this calculation, a new region of frequency that are harder, uh, that is, uh, relevant only for the uh, massless or shockwave scattering. And that's the question mark of this log that Thibault was referring. And uh, to me, that's not uh, uh, a clarified issue. But I just understand uh, <coughs> this crisis was based on particular G2 calculation. Yeah. When you do calculation to the Bayesian theory, to any other perturbative expansion, you're breaking all those things in your entity. So then, uh, how do you know that those corrections which you don't take into account, those which have powers in G, will not resolve this problem? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. So you see, the, this uh, answer like this requires always a resummation of perturbation theory because you see, it, it has a non polynomial. So this answer here has a polynomial dependence on G. So this is fine, right? Now, what I'm saying is that uh, the soft, uh, the, the analysis of the soft uh, radiation taught us that we need to resum certain classes and uh, uh, in order to uh, describe the high energy regime. And that resummation is responsible for non-analytic uh, 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 terms in G. Yeah, but this is one this is term which you obtained before. It's what happened like block Nordic when you have African divergence cut constant count replaced by some Fred cutoff. But now you're saying that this formula it doesn't come from the soft gravity emission, it comes from the emission of the graviton, which well No, exactly. Which means that they're not soft physics behind. So it's if it's not soft physics, why should I draw an analogy to the soft physics? Uh, yeah, no, I... Okay, I don't think... I, I, I mean, if I had a good answer, I would write here... Uh, the, the, uh, so what, what I just can tell you is that... Uh, um, uh, there are two works that, uh, two lines of research that Gabriele uh, has pushed. So this paper with Grudzinov is more like just GR. It's just a pure, no, no diagrammatic. And then uh, he, he had later a paper that was quoted before 
uh, with the Chafalonian collaborator, where they do, they, they try to argue a resummation for the non-soft diagrams. Now, how solid that is, I don't know. I have not, uh, not reproduced. But this answer here uh, that they get from both, both approaches, so that's what makes them confident, requires, from the amplitude point of view, a resummation uh, that, that is responsible for this non-analytic uh, for non this non analytic structure. So it's certainly not, not a non-trivial <coughs> thing. Very good. So let me conclude. You might say, okay, everything we have seen, the worst. Well, okay, with energy crisis 4, that's the most recent one, I think just a few months. So uh, what people have done recently is to go one order higher, so 4 p.m. So that means three loops. And uh, the pattern that I tried to convey for 3 p.m., where we had radiation more problematic, requiring uh, a threshold and a change of behavior, but uh, the angle, the mechanical part, being smooth, that pattern is broken. From the result we have so far, we seem to have a bit the opposite. At 4 p.m., the mechanical part describing the angle uh, has a power-like divergence in this high energy regime and uh, the radiative part has only a log uh, type divergence. So I think these results are very new uh, in, in these papers and uh, I think uh, uh, it certainly tells us that uh, the story is not complete yet and uh, either we have to reassess our understanding of the ultra relativistic limit as based on 3 p.m., saying no, maybe that was just too simple, or maybe it's pointing out uh, that uh, we haven't really disentangled well uh, radiative and conservative effects. So uh, this is where we are now, and so let me uh, just. Uh, uh, leave this slide of conclusions. Thank you very much. Are there more questions or comments? Uh, very elementary comment. So I didn't get what is the sharp expansion parameter in this PM uh, perturbation theory. Sharp meaning uh, with possible uh, order one factor fixed in the sense that you, you don't know you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alpha in QED, where uh, it's really alpha and not alpha over 4 pi. It's alpha, <laughs> no? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is there an analogous uh, power which governs uh, this expansion? Yeah, I mean... Uh, okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. Just, but I thought uh, alpha over pi or 4 pi was better than alpha. No, <laughs> alpha the expansion. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. The so yeah, the, the expansion is just uh, uh, the, this quantity g m over b. G m over b. Yeah. Then uh, I mean, um, if you want to, uh, okay, I, I don't introduce a new name, right? G is the Newton constant that appears in the action. M is the mass that appears in the, in the action as well, uh, and uh, B is the impact parameter. Energy is not energy. E over B, yeah. Yeah, then, uh, then uh, yes, then, uh, as I was saying here, if you make uh, sigma large, then uh, this object, GM over B, they come with factor of sigmas. And then if you want to define a, a large energy limit, then you have to reabsorb that factors of energy in, uh, in, in using the energy and not m. Otherwise, you get diverged. I mean, you could try to define a high energy limit where you keep fix the Schwarzschild radius, gm, and send e to infinity, but then that that everything would diverge, right? Uh, so if you want to define a high energy limit, then what you need to do is this. Take factor of uh, root sigma and uh, uh, attach it to M, right? And then you keep fixed the would-be Schwarzschild radius of the uh, black hole that you would get by merging the two objects. Uh, 
But uh, yeah, th that's the best I can do. I mean, just written everything in terms of uh, elementary parameters that you, uh, you you have in the action. So sometime uh, then uh, uh, I use R e, or equivalently, you can think that this is a small angle expansion, right? So uh, since uh, uh, G e over B is theta. Uh, at leading order, right? You can rearrange and say, okay, what I'm actually doing is an expansion for uh, for a fixed but small angle, um, and that's a dimensionless quantity. And so that's why I think uh, uh, at the uh, final bit I was writing everything in terms of theta, because then it's dimensionless and it's uh, it's uh, easier. Yeah. <coughs> a question and a comment. If you could show a formula for the immediate energy, this Jacob formula. This yes, one. this one, yeah. So, <coughs> so this, uh, you see this uh, FC of sigma, it comes with some function of sigma. Yeah, yeah, these are the functions. No, no, like, uh, up, upper line, up line, the first line. Ah, this one, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, this is a custom normal dimension. This function. Ah, yeah, um, okay, okay. Called yeah. It's called Bresson function in all this inquiry. But you say just, just this one, just F3. Coefficient in front of FC. So this function which FC multiplies. Ah, this oh, one, I see. Uh, <coughs> and the question is, so you, you, you're dealing with a classical radial limit. So in the radial limit, uh, so high and scattering we're talking about, it's, uh, kinematically it's radial mm -hmm. limit. So in the radial limit you explain all those things happen. So how does your calculation uh, match the radial limit expectation? So for radial limit, you are think, uh, thinking as much bigger than t. Yes, small angle. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. In some sense, yes, yes. In some sense, so yes. you're expecting. It's just that here we are having uh, um, uh, an extra bit, which is the masses, right? That doesn't matter. Uh, so your kinematics when the center of mass scattering energy much bigger than masses of the particles. Is the radial limit? Okay, we are not uh, necessarily taking that the energy is much bigger than the masses of the particles, right? The ma we could do, and that's why we can make, uh, uh, people can make a link with this Pn expansion, right? Uh, so, so sigma is a completely arbitrary thing and we could be in a regime where the total center of mass energy is large because the rest mass is large and velocity are small and this may contact with Pn. But we could also go in the limit. Let's go to the limit when center of energy for fixed masses. Yeah. Center of mass energy goes to infinity. Yeah, exactly. Th that's this high energy limit that I'm interested in. Yeah, very good. So in this limit, you, <coughs> you, you're speaking the amplitude have to take a form which predicted by radius theory. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand that you're looking for the, so you have a radial trajectory of the graviton. You could write formal factorize your, for example, amplitude we're talking about when you have two to three ignition. Two to three, which we have this um, multi radio factorization property, etc. etc. So, there are a lot of different constraints which come out from the assumptions that the amplitude has to satisfy all the radio constraints. Did you try to check those constraints? Okay, maybe we can discuss, uh, Sebati. No, I, the answer is no, but uh, I think. TV, they are using Regge Gribov theory where, where they do use propagators yes. which are regeized. Yeah, but I, I think I, I'm not sure that you, you are thinking about the same regularization because I think you have in, in mind QCD. Uh, I mean, the gravity, I mean, it's, it's, the, the regularization, it's, it doesn't matter which thing you're talking about. Once you're in kinematical regime which corresponds to the gravity, you're expecting that your calculation will be in terms of those regularized uh, objects. Like rigid trajectory okay, okay. yeah. of the graviton emission of the graviton. I think what uh, Thibault has in mind was more in the string theory context. Well, the regular trajectory is really, I mean, the, the, this is a, would, be a, would have been a whole other talk, right? You could uh, take what I was doing and instead of doing in a, a GR setup, in a string theory setup, and then uh, it's not just the graviton that dominates because the graviton comes in string theory with its own regular trajectory uh, that is not coming from Feynman diagrams, right? It's really uh, particles. And, uh, and they are of higher and higher spin. So they coupled more and more to, to energy. And so, uh, but, but they are massive. So they, they kick in only when the impact parameter becomes uh, of 
uh, stringy sized but that's a, a whole interesting uh, interesting story and there you keep uh, keep track of those rigid trajectory but i'm not sure so these are the rigid the yeah the uh, as the alpha prime i'm not sure these are the rigid trajectory so i would like to learn more about that the expectation of uh, the two three amplitude that you were showing is that so the expectation is coming from the fact that we are at large impact parameters or there's some other reason for the expectation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, the, expe the exp expectation is uh, exactly as you say, because we are in a classical regime. And then uh, if I understand your question is, did people check uh, that, uh, right? For instance, as we did for uh, 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. And this is, uh, I think, Stefano uh, uh, can, can tell us more. But this is a recent, uh, uh, recent developments so, of uh, what I've been doing here was based only on the leading order two to three amplitude, and recently people calculated the first subleading order of two to three, uh, three, and so the same pattern should apply, uh, right? So this is not based on soft; it should apply for all frequency, and you should see that in the second uh, subleading order, which is a one-loop five-point amplitude, there is a sector of the answer which is the exponentiation of the three level uh, elastic times the three level inelastic uh, and uh, and this you can see by looking at the cuts uh, so th this is uh, yeah is a recent uh, recent means uh, last month i think okay thank you thank you